He's in the building. <laughs> the Antichrist. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Al Person. You can contact me at pastor at mascot.church, which is my email address, or in the comments below if you like. If you like this video or share it or whatever, uh, YouTube might recommend the channel on to somebody else, but you never really know. I hope you're all doing well. I'm going to... Uh, uh, tell you a very fascinating little story from uh, my past about the title that uh, that has to do with the title of the video here. I'll need to set the stage, unfortunately, for, not unfortunately, but um, some of you might say, ah, you know, we'll get right to the point. What I'll do is in the comments below, I'll, I'll just tag where you need to get to to get to the story. Um, the, the word I want to share, the first word is the word eschatology. Now, I know a lot of the, you know, visitors here might not know what some of these words mean. So typically the study of eschatology, from a Christian perspective anyways, is the study of end things as spoken of in the Bible end things as spoken of in the Bible. That's kind of a good street definition. And so um, that's, uh, that's critical to this discussion today. There are several different eschatological positions. Mine is what's called, the position I hold is what's called the preterist position. That is, I see that prophecy in the Bible is fulfilled already in our past. When Jesus was speaking about things to come, when Paul was speaking about things to come, when the New Testament was, you find um, uh, typical passages would be uh, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, Luke 17, the book of Revelation. Those things are not talking about things that are in our future, but in the future to the writers. And so that's the preterist position. Then other positions, you could generally call them futurist. So they would say that there is prophecy that is unfolding in our day that has yet to be fulfilled. Now, the futurist Christian camp in the West can, can be kind of distinguished. You can kind of divide it into various camps. One would be the historicist. That is, things are unfolding over time in history, and there's a lot of overlap with these. The other would be the uh, millennial, post-millennial. I'm going to put the two of them together, which treat the modern-day uh, time period as the age of the millennium or something like that. These are complicated to get sort of your head around, but they kind of sit in that same camp together. Um, Though some post-millennialists might not like that. but And the uh, last one I'll talk about is the dispensational position. And that's the one that holds that there are seven dispensations from creation to the end. And that uh, the seven dispensations can be referenced or are seen in the seven churches of Revelation and in different other things. So it's a little bit historicist, but it's a bit it's a bit sort of messed up like that. Uh, one of the things about the dispensational position is that it holds that Israel and the church are extremely distinct in s such that when God was dealing with Israel in the Old Testament, he did not prophesy about the church. Now, I disagree with that, and, uh, but that's the position that dispensationalism holds. And it also holds that God has a period of, of work to do in Israel that never got finished in the Old Testament period. And that work was put on pause at the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. And um, so different Different camps of dispensationalists will adjust these time periods, but pure dispensationalism says that God was dealing with Israel, but Israel rejected the kingship of Christ, which they didn't. They tried to make him king, but that's another story. <laughs> but Israel rejected the kingship of Christ. They crucified him, and God had this unfinished business. So he put Israel's time clock on hold, and he brought an other people into the picture, which we call the church which is the uh, combination of Gentiles and some Jews who came in, and that this began to happen in their position on the day of Pentecost. And it's happening now, but it's going to end at some time. And that time when it ends will, will be a time when God will turn Israel's clock back on. Okay, And that's when those future prophecies yet to be fulfilled will be fulfilled. Now, what will what God will then have to do in the dispensational model is... He can't have the church and Israel on the uh, were, uh, uh, on earth at the same time because remember these two things they they, they 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 don't work together. This is pure dispensationalism, by the way. So he's going to pull the church away, and that is the the word they use is he's going to rapture the church. You've heard about that, haven't you? An ejection seat, bam, pull it, pull the church away for a period of time, 
And from then on, God will use only Israel, some form of reconstituted Israel with a third temple into the millennium. And depending on who you talk to, maybe forever and past then. And the church will always be the servants of this reconstituted Israel. So that's the dispensational position. Now, the real distinctions then have to be clarified before I can tell you this story. The distinctions are that the church and Israel are profoundly separate. And that, uh, so what is the church? That's, that is believers that are, um, uh, that would include what we would call Gentiles, believers from the nations, and um, as well as some Jews, but they're not to be, um, they're, they're not on the earth functioning at the same time at all. This is pure dispensationalism. In the Old Testament, their position is the church was not prophesied, maybe alluded to in the most distant way. And that in the church, age, which we're in now, in their view, it's going to come to an end. Israel is not being dealt with. Now, that's this, this is where the fun is. A pure dispensationalist, a pure dispensationalist would not be saying prophecies being fulfilled today because uh, that those prophecies that are allegedly to be being fulfilled today should not be fulfilled while the church is here. Now, many people who stand up and say these prophecies are being fulfilled today, who are kind of rapture believers, I will say they don't know their own doctrine. They just don't. They, 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 they don't realize that. They won't deal with the distinctions here either. And so um, when you talk about, uh, and, and by the way, there's a, a large number of attempts to make this work. And I've, I've asked dispensational preachers, well, how can this happen? How could 1948, for example, have been a fulfillment of prophecy if the church is still here. Uh, well, uh, well, usually you get a, well, that shouldn't be a problem, but then you say, but your dispensational model does not allow this to happen. And it's like, mm, it's fascinating. Okay, it's time for my story. And uh, so, but you, are you holding this distinction in your mind? You've kind of got this, the two can't happen at the same time, all right? So I, in 1999, oh, by the way, my preterist move, journey to preterism came uh, I'm very grateful to an American dispensationalist preacher who I'm going to reference here, whose name is Billy Brim, a lady, because I caught her at a conference here in our city um, using information and misinterpreting, completely getting wrong information uh, that she presented publicly that I had firsthand knowledge about. I wasn't particularly interested. She was off in doing eschatology things. I was thinking, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. You know, get on to the other things I want to hear you talk about. And she made some, of, and she, she had a message about this. I had firsthand knowledge that what she said was dead wrong. And my antenna went up and that start, started my journey. Well, this particular um, uh, preacher lady has um, uh, one of her, I guess you could say obsessions, is with a building in Belgium called the uh, Palace of Justice, the Palais de Justice or whatever I've but there's a French version of it in whatever words. And, and I might put the Wikipedia link below. It's a fascinating building with some really interesting history. And she believes, and she says, well, this, this building was built in the, I guess, the 1800s from, and the plan was that we would rule the world from there. And of course, uh, the United Nations has its headquarters, or the European Union, I guess, has its headquarters in Belgium. And, uh, and Belgium is a great place for some of these big IT startups to, to, to land and, and so on. And, and so she's on about that. Still reasonably recent, she's still doing that. And uh, uh, it is her position that, the, um, uh, that this will be the palace that is going to, that the Antichrist will rule from during his upcoming reign. Okay, now remember, I'm a preterist, so I don't see those things as future. And her own eschatology, uh, well, she's kind of famous for never getting things right, but that's another conversation for another time. Anyways, you've got to hold this distinction in your head. It's really important because, you know, and so this is her thing. She's done a number of tours around the building. I think they'd be great tours to join because she does, talks a lot about the history of the building and so on and so forth. For that sake, they'd probably be pretty cool if you could get onto one of those. Uh, and um, uh, you can find that on her blog. Anyways, so here we are at this conference in, um, in my city. And uh, she's talking about a tour that she has in this building. And I wish I could get the original audio of this. I've got to try to find out if, if I can get it. Uh, if it was recorded, uh, I was there. I was definitely there, but it was about 150 people in the audience. And uh, she had the audience on the edge of her seat. And already by then I was saying, I just don't, I really, why am I even here? You know, that's that sort of thing. 
And um, <laughs> and she said, well, she said, at, 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 she was doing this tour and um, they were in the building and they were taking an elevator, you know, from one floor down so they could leave the building. And on the way down, she said the elevator stopped and between floors. And I think she said something like, and the lights went out. And then the lights came back on. And I'm going to try to get as close as I can to quoting her. She said that she, uh, it's been a long time, but I've never forgotten this. She said, this, 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 this awareness went, came over me. This awareness came over me. Oh, you know, it's like, I just knew. And this is what I heard from my spirit, she said. He's in the building. Yeah. Now, the he that he was talking about, of course, is the Antichrist. In her view, and what she said to this audience was, in 1999, it might have been 2000, but it was about that time, might have been 2000. Uh, events of 2001 hadn't happened yet, so because she talked a lot about that. So it would have been, you know, he's in the building. Now, there were a lot of problems with that. First of all, that means that the Antichrist has been in the building or working in the area for some 24, nearly 25 years now. He's getting on. Just that might be something that's part of this conversation. The other thing is that in the pure dispensational model, Israel, the prophecies of Revelation that are not fulfilled, and the church are distinct. And those prophecies are not to be fulfilled while the church is here. So in her own observation that the Antichrist is in the building, right? That very observation, she was already breaking her own rules. Now, strangely, of course, I didn't believe what she said outright. The audience was aghast. <gasps> oh, you, I mean, you could just feel the terror in the room. <laughs> such a great story, you know, and I think back. You can just feel the terror in the room. And I, I might have been the only person who was thinking, oh, dear Lord, no, you can't be doing this. Because I knew straight away, it is not possible in her eschatological position to believe or to preach that these things are happening. Strange, isn't it? Well, why is eschatology important? I'm not sure that all of my audience knows this, and this is really something we probably do need to do. But a lot of the political um, machinations of the last 30 or 40 years, uh, particularly out of America and the UK, have, uh, have had Christians alongside them, helping, working with these things. And you say, well, why are the churches so involved in this? Not all of the churches, but, you know, some. You know, after the tragic events of September the 11th, why were the churches um, uh, saying, yeah, go ahead, go to war, do the bombing, etc., etc.? Why weren't the religious leaders saying, let's get these people around the table with us and say, what have we done to cause you to be so aggrieved with us? You know, not how many bombs can we drop on your country, but how many hospitals can we build for you? How many roads can we build for you? What is the problem? Now, Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. They should be called the sons of God. And then, of course, we had um, the Iraq war afterwards. It was a terribly tragic thing. Just recently on a news program here, I heard um, news commentators laughing about the Iraq war. Well, that was a big mistake, wasn't it? Ha, ha, ha. No weapons of mass destruction there. Ha, ha, ha. I thought more than a million people died because of this. It was terrible. You know, this horrible thing. But again, when this was happening, and of course in Iraq were a large number of Christians, I didn't hear my Christian minister friend say, listen, let's get them around the table and see if we can talk about peace first rather than these things. You know, governments are going to go to war, I understand. But where were the churches crying for peace? Where were the churches saying, let's, op let's open our hands to one another and see if we can avoid this? Well, why was that the case? Why were they not doing that? Why were the big American mega preachers and, and so many not doing it? Well, probably, had they called for peace, they might have gotten off the air. I don't know if that's the case. Probably moderates wouldn't have gotten off the air if they know how to handle themselves. I don't know. But then you had a lot of guys on the grassroots. Why not? Well, because their eschatology demanded wars in the Middle East. In their view, peace was not the issue. War was on the agenda. And war with 
the Iraq Babylon was necessary. It had to happen. So rather than say, let's get the Iraqis around the table and try to have peace, no. It's all about, this is the time for war. You see, this entire um, this in, in, entire thing was, I, I believe it would have happened in any case without the churches, but the churches went right along with this journey. And you see this so often. I think in many cases, you see Christians going along with things because they're saying, oh, well, the world's about to blow itself up anyways. And you know, what, what, why bother? Why engage or, or, or whatever? That may be the case too. Eschatology is important. Now, if you say, well, eschatology isn't important, let me rephrase the question. Is your view about the future important? Uh, yes. Yes, I'm pretty sure. Unless you are, and even if you are you know you have just a short time left here on earth, you might be thinking about other people. In fact, there's something inside us that makes our view about the future. It, it's much more important to us than we really, really think. Think about, for, think for a moment about uh, environmental activists or people, you know, they want to save the planet, but they have no real sense of God or no real sense of eternity or nothing. Why do you even want to save something if it's, if it's, doesn't matter to you when you're gone. Uh, and I've seen this with kind of your, um, you know, your crusading environmentalist types. Now, I'm not making a comment on that movement or all, but I'm just looking at some of these kind of individuals who, uh, some have no children, uh, no family, nothing, whatever, but they're all about saving the planet to their last dying breath. I'm saying, well, why should, even, why should it even matter to you? You're not leaving anything behind or experiencing anything. Why not? Well, you see, there's an indwelt thing in all of us that is concerned about the future, and it's intimately concerned about our own future. I think some of these people want to do it because they want to leave a legacy of some sort. That's just interesting. I've never really totally figured it out. Well, as a Christian, I understand that these things are in our own souls because we're supposed to think about our eternal futures, and we have the ability to do that. And uh, several, a couple of months ago, I had an opportunity to, uh, to visit a man uh, doing some pastoral care for a minister who's out of town. And uh, uh, he was in and out of consciousness. And, and while in a, in a conscious time, he spoke to me and he, he knew who I was and what I was there for. And he said, you know, and, and I couldn't get him on scriptures or anything. I couldn't get his attention. It wasn't working. I thought, okay, Lord, just really help me. And he said, you know, it really bothers me when innocent people you know, are, oppre are, are, are oppressed or, you know, uh, things, you know, bad things happen to innocent people or, you know, bad things happen to, right? And I right away knew a way that I could get to him. And I said, uh, sir, I said, um, isn't it interesting that you have the capability to know that a thing is good or a thing is bad? You have some kind of a gift that animals don't have. If we were just animals, you'd say, well, might is right. The strongest animal gets to eat the weakest. So be it. But there's something in you that knows that something's wrong. There's something in you that knows that something could be right. What do you think that is? And I explained to him the, the, that um, uh, because we're created in the image of God, we have a sense of good and evil that is beyond anything else in the created order. And his eyes lit up. And I prayed with him. We had a very good talk. My following visit, he remembered our visit. And that was really, really great. There's a sense on the inside of right and sort of wrong. Eschatology is important. A view of the future is important. Our view of the future is important. And let me tell you, when Billy Brim was in the Palace of Justice, in the Palace of Justice all those years ago, and the elevator jammed between floors, it was not God who said, he's in the building at all. My name is Al Persson. Come back again next week.